So this is the optimization problem. It's it's actually a simple optimization problem. It's a quadratic objective, okay, and a set of linear constraints, right? We already saw how to solve this. You guys did, right? right so you had a convex optimization tutorial. So one of the things that we are looking for from the convex optimization tutorial is that you will know how to solve this problem. Okay. So, um, right, so what we do after this? Write a Lagrangian, right? Is that fine? <coughs> 1 minus y, take the minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, I mean it's, it's fine, I can do whatever, right. So, uh, right. so I, I have to apply this for every data point, so I run runs from I, I equal 1 to n, okay. And I put a p there, so so that's a primal. So we'll have to form the dual of this. The dual looks a lot easier to solve. Okay, the dual is actually a lot easier to solve. So we will go ahead and do the dual. So for first, I'll set, I'll take the derivatives, right? Um, So derivative with respect to beta, right? You can do that and solve it. You'll get that derivative with respect to beta naught. Okay. So now it's where I'm going to do some hand waving, but uh, you can go through this computation. So take that, substitute into this, okay? and do a lot of uh, simplification, right. So remember we have this beta squared here, therefore I am going to get a alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j kind of terms, right. So the dual will be So the dual is going to be a slightly simpler form. Why is it a slightly simpler form? So I have to only consider my constraints have become of a lot simpler here, right? It's just going to be alpha i should be non-negative. Okay, that's all my constraints are. So it turns out that there are efficient ways of solving optimization problems of this form. Right? You don't have to worry about it. I mean, there are lots of packages that uh, solve SVMs for you. Uh, but then uh, you just you need to know what the optimization problem you are solving, right? I don't want you to use it as a black box, right? So essentially, what you are going to be solving is this, right? So 
when you have a solution, when you have something that is uh, uh, both primal and dual feasible, you can actually show that the, the, the duality gap is zero in this case. So, I'm, let's not go into that. But uh, the point is, when I have a solution to the problem, right, it has to satisfy certain conditions. So, I already looked at that. The KKT conditions. If people do not remember it, please go back and revise that. Right, so there are a whole bunch of things. So you need to, for you need to have the, the solution to be primal feasible, right? You need to have the solution to be dual feasible, right? And so that essentially uh, would have a bunch of things, right? Uh, primal feasible would mean that uh, well, your alpha i's have to be great. That will be dual feasible, right? That will be one condition. Yeah, this these need to hold, right? Because it's a um, solution for the primal and then you, are, you have your complementary slackness, right. So, that in this case becomes right. So, so I, I, I do not know if in the notes I think you saw it as lambda i f i, right. So, this essentially that is it. So, this is alpha i into f i, right. So, this is this is my effect. So, that is the fourth. Okay, these are the KKT conditions that need to be satisfied. Okay. And uh, so, what does this tell us? It tells us a couple of things. One, so we know what the form of beta should be. What is the form of beta? It has to be alpha i y i x i. Right. So, it is essentially what you are going to do is your beta will be taking out certain data points from your training data right, and adding them up. So, suitably I mean multiplying it by the, uh, uh, the output the desired output. So, if x i's output was positive then this will be plus 1, if x i's output was negative this will be minus 1. So, you are going to take a few of those and you are going to add them up right. So, this should remind you of perceptrons. So, if you remember what we did in perceptrons is we took whatever was misclassified we just kept adding it to the weight vector right. So, in, in some sense you are doing something very similar to that, in, but instead of having some kind of a heuristic approach to optimizing things right, I mean we did do a, a, a gradient descent right, but then uh, we just said okay we will arbitrarily pick the set of misclassified points and we will do the gradient descent and so on and so forth, but here we started off by saying okay we will minimize the distance to the uh, the closest point and from there we derive something and it looks very suspiciously like the perceptron update rule okay. In fact, uh, nowadays uh, when people say I am going to train a perceptron uh, they are actually doing this more often than using the perceptron learning rule okay. Um, right, great. So, now something else that you can observe. So, this condition has to be satisfied, right. This condition has to be satisfied, right. So, let us look at it. There are two terms here. So, when will this be 0? When either this is 0 or that is 0, right. right? Is there some condition when this has to be 0? Sorry? For what constraints? Oh, okay, fine. But mm, geometrically, can you give me an answer? Yeah, you are right. But for geometrically, can you give me an answer? So, if this, uh, when this has to be zero, is when this guy is not zero. Duh, right? So, when will this guy be not zero? When it is not the closest point, right? If if x i is the closest point, it will be bang on the margin, right? For a point here, that term will be 0, right. For a point here, that term will be greater than 1, right. Or a point here, that term will be greater than 1. You see that? So, since that term will be greater than 1, the term in the square brackets will be non 0. So, alphas have to be 0, correct. So, what does this mean? It means that points that are farther away from the hyperplane do not contribute in to finding beta because the alphas will be 0. 
right, points that are far away from the hyperplane are not going to contribute in finding beta. In fact, the points that will contribute to beta are exactly those points that are on the margin. So, in fact, for this, this data set that I drew here, right, there are only two important points, right, that one and this one, because only two points are on the margin, right. That makes sense. So, such points which lie on the margin are known as support points or support vectors. And your beta is going to depend only on the support points. What about beta naught? Okay. So, we can plug in any data point here and we can solve for beta naught. Right? One of the support points, you can plug it in here and you can solve for beta naught. Which support point do you pick? Ideally, all of them should give you the same answer, but usually it does not happen because of uh, numerical reasons. So, what typically people do is they plug in all the support points, okay, solve for beta naught and take the average. Right? So, each one in turn, right, for every support point, you are going to get slightly different beta naught, you just take the average. Okay? So, that is how you compute the hyperplane. Right at the end of it, you basically have your yeah. We can also have case when the point is on the margin uh, as well as the alpha is zero. Uh, potentially. That can be the case. Uh -huh. and if, so would that point? Be called a support point or not? So, when would alpha be 0 if your data is on the hyperplane, so on the margin? Sorry? Yeah, so that will be the one case when that happens. So, essentially, you have two points which are on the same things, not collinear, but repeated things. I give you two data points that are on the same point. Right, so by definition, most of the support vectors will lie on the same line, so it can't be collinear. Okay, so uh, right in such cases, that could be the case, uh, but uh, yeah, these are generally degenerate cases. Yeah, so yeah, sure, call them support vectors if you want. Okay. Um, yeah. So one thing to note is my f hat. Right. So, how is this going to look like now that I given the form for beta here? This is essentially going to look like a 
I, I can flip these things around anyway that plus beta naught right so, so if you think about it I will come back to this point later so if you look at the dual I only have x transpose x right and if you look at the final classifier I am going to use I am going to have x transpose x right so if I have a very efficient way of computing x transpose x right I can do some tricks with this whole thing we will come back to that ok I will just I want you to remember this so any questions on this any questions on this so before we move on I just wanted to point out something so if you think about um, how LDA works right so LDA tries to do a density estimation eventually right if you if you think about it you make some assumptions about the probability distribution the, the form of the probability distribution what assumption would you make it is Gaussian with uh, equal covariance uh, across all the classes right though that essentially means that every data point in your training set is going to contribute towards the parameters that you are estimating right so the betas you will estimate there will depend on all the data points that were given to you whether they are here right close to the hyperplane or whether they are very far away from the hyperplane right so all the data points will determine your class boundary so that means that it becomes little susceptible to noise right if I have one or two data points that are generated through noise right even that will contribute to determining the separating plane hyperplane right on the other hand with this uh, with this kind of optimal hyperplanes we are only worried about points that are close to the boundary right so I can do whatever I want here right I can change move a few points over here and things like that it does not really matter what matters is if any noise enters close to the boundary right so the so in some sense if my noise is uniform right the LDA will get more affected because even if noise inserts are points there right the LDA classifier will change right while my optimal uh, hyperplane classifier will not move it will be affected only by that fraction of the noise that changes the actual decision surface right does it make sense having said that I should point out that if uh, if your data is truly Gaussian with equal covariance okay, LDA is actually optimal it is probably optimal okay. while uh, this one will uh, depend on uh, the actual data that you get but um, in general I would say that this is more uh, preferable because this is more stable people remember what stability is right small changes in the data will not cause the classifier to change significantly right so here small changes in the data will not cause it to change significantly in an expected sense right if I go and take the support vector and move it somewhere else okay the class the class uh, boundary will change right but then I have whole bunch of other vectors which I can move around nothing will happen to the class boundary unless I move it closer to the hyperplane than the existing support vectors right if I take a point from here and move it here of course the class boundary will change so as long as I do not modify which are the support vectors right I will get back the same classification surface again and again right so in that sense SVM or we will come to SVMs little bit this kind of optimal hyperplanes are very stable Okay, so any other question? We'll move on. Okay. 